Welcome to the Ransom Tart Podcast. Today, you're listening to Alan Arnold and Morgan Snyder. And actually, we were going to have this conversation over a beer or over lunch, and I just thought it would be fun instead to have it with you. And so what we're going to talk about in here is the journey that we've been on with our children in terms of inviting them into this message, into a larger story. And what does that look like for a boy or for a girl who's eight, nine, 10, maybe going on 15, 16, who necessarily would not have read our resources, hasn't read Wild at Heart yet, hasn't read Captivating yet, hasn't been to an event yet. But as a parent or grandparent who's listening, how do you bring them into the life and the freedom of this message at an earlier age? So I'm glad you're listening. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. And Morgan, let's just begin with, I think, a story that they'd love to hear, which is your son, Joshua, and take us back to what you planned for him about a year ago Mm -hmm. in terms of of just an event or ceremony that was a defining mark for him moving from boyhood to young manhood. Thanks, Alan. You know, in some ways, this category of parenting is just all frontier. I remember one mentor said, if you want to know how you're doing as a parent, you can start seriously considering that question when your children are about 40. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Part of it was frustrating. And and yet there's a part that's relieving, right? Talk about an area where you can't base how you're doing on outcomes. It is rolling the dice. It is all frontier. Um, Having said that, there are a few other places in my life that I want to love well. Right. And I want to care and see my children, Abigail, Joshua, being formed into becoming truly the people that God intended them to be. So with Joshua, he turned 10. He really was in the midst of a transition where he was entering that stage of going from little boy to older boy, soon to be young man. And at the same time, I was aware that most men, like me and most men, had to grow up way too young. Most men, when you get to the heart of their story, they had to be a man far before they were ready in their soul to be a man. And so it's very delicate to say, how do I initiate my son and validate him as he's becoming a young man? And at the same time, how do I celebrate boyhood and invite him to continue to enjoy boyhood. So we roll the dice, but he was reaching this mark. And I felt like the father gave me the word man scouts for it as a framework, a metaphor of his decade from boy to man, roughly starting around 10 and roughly concluding around 21. But the idea is I want his masculine journey with God to be his largest story. And I want it to be a bigger story than all of the worldly markers of graduations and the rites of passages of the world. I want his masculine journey to be center stage. And so I felt like it was time for his first formal rite of passage. And it was birthed really out of watching one of my friends do it. He had brought his son into a really beautiful cabin with a fellowship of his peers. So not his son's friends, but all of his friends. And so there were 11 of us older men around this young man. Mm. And my buddy looked at his son, Alan, and said, I can't bring you everything you need as a man. That God's entrusted me with a piece of it, with a portion of it, but you need to be fathered by a community. Because you need to know that it's God the Father who's leading your story, and I am a piece of it. And by God's grace, I want to be the biggest piece of it. But ultimately, every man in this room carries a piece of what it means to be a man. And through interacting with this fellowship, I want to invite you to experience masculinity, not just my version of it, but a community's version. And through it, you can become a man and more importantly, become the man that God has made you to be. And so he invited his son 
to spend time with each of those men over a year's time. And so that was where I got the initial idea. But it Okay, could... just pause there because as I'm listening to you, and I think the listeners may feel the same way, if thinking back to our own childhood, imagine the impact as a boy, 10-year-old, 11-year-old, mm. of being not at a birthday party with another 10 or 12 kids your own age, or a celebration with those kids who were your peers, but to be with the company of these older men Mm -hmm. who you look up to and who you're in awe of and who have accomplished quite a bit in their life. And they didn't gather to hang out with you as a dad. They gathered to hang out with the son, with the boy. I can't even fathom what that would have felt like, but it would have been life-changing had that happened to me at that age. How about you? Oh, absolutely. I was looking around the room thinking, who in this room received anything like this when they were a boy? And there wasn't one. There wasn't one. And so this isn't because we received it. It's because we become what we didn't have. Right. Right. Yeah. To watch him walk into the room and I can tell you actually what happened and I could tell you it was like because I asked him and it was so wonderful. So we're in a friend's game room, which Joshua and I are hunters. And so it was a holy space. And he walks in and I had his favorite food, Chick-fil-A, you know, unlimited. And normally it's a little limited. Unlimited. It was unlimited <laughs> right. and beers for the guys. But he got, you know, a regular Coke. And right there you have his heart, right? He goes, this is for me, dad. It's your friends, but this is for me. And we set out pictures of him. Yes. And I just tear up now even just thinking of the delight. It's the father's delight for the son that's available, that not just my delight for Joshua, but modeling God the Father's delight for us. And I began the evening with that to all the men. I said, what you experience here tonight of us towards Joshua is your father's heart towards you. The risk is receiving it. And so in that night, you know, we focused first on boyhood, celebrated his life and watched a movie I put together of pictures of his childhood. And then we gave him some gifts and those gifts were all about boyhood. And it was, you know, a gift certificate for Legos, which are his favorite and a gift certificate to go Hmm. do dart wars with us. And what we wanted to say, Alan, to him is you have permission to be a boy. You don't have to rush. We will do everything we can to protect and preserve your childhood. And you are on time, son. And you could just see his heart feel the ease of it. Mm. You know, so many stories I hear of the rites of passages of young men actually end up being quite wounding because the sons feel pressure that they now have to be a man when they don't yet feel like they're a man. But the truth is when a man has permission to be a boy, and he's cultivated over time in love, he can't help but to become a wholehearted man. And so the evening started with focus on boyhood, and then it moved into an invitation of the realities of Joshua. Your body's changing, and you're growing. And I referenced that even the week before, we were swimming together, and he was teaching me how to do a flip turn. And I went, Hmm. whoa, we just reached a threshold in our journey together where the son is teaching the father. So I was able to say, and also as we celebrate boyhood, these are your steps into masculinity. And the way God led me, I had had a custom sword made, a wooden claymore. And it was very symbolic because it was a wooden sword. This wasn't a steel claymore to entrust to a 10-year-old. It wasn't over the top. It was to say, son, this is a weapon and you need training, but this is also a training sword, and it's a playful sword. And so again, it's not about pressure, it's about invitation. And then we also gave him, we call it the Man Scout's treasure chest, where it's a box that, it's a wooden chest that he will take, hopefully the rest of his life. And I told him, I said, Joshua, this box is the symbol of God's initiation of your masculine heart, and in it, you get to put your treasures of all the pieces that God sows into your life through the lives of older men, and all those men will sign it. So that night, the fellowship of men that I had gathered around Joshua, they all signed it with a Sharpie, and Joshua presented them with a Man Scout sticker so they could remember, be mindful to pray for him. But he sat there, 
as these older men told stories of their boyhood. And what was amazing, Alan, was it wasn't pressure. It was right. celebration. And I could see in their eyes of there's so much that's not being shared of the suffering I know of every man's story. Right. But this wasn't the time of suffering. Those days will come to communicate that. This was the day of celebration to say, Joshua, I was like you. And one day you will be like me. And I invite you into my world as your uncle. Mm. I invite you. You have access and permission to be a part of my life. There's room in my heart for you. And we prayed over him and blessed him. And then Sherry, my wife, jumped in for that part. And it was holy to be there together. And we were driving in the truck on the way home in the snow. It was heavy snow. And so it just felt so intimate. And I said, Joshua, how was that for you? And, you know, my little 10-year-old Chick-fil-A nugget eating guy, you know, and he just turned over at me with this big smile and he said, Daddy, I have never felt so loved before in my wow. life. Wow. And I have never felt so cared for. Mm. I mean, that's it right there. And Morgan, what I love is for you and Joshua and your journey together as father, son, it's not a one time event. Like that's not it. And oh, then it's, it's so done. important. It's a marker, and it's something I think he'll always remember. He'll be 80 years old and remember that day and that celebration. But it's one piece of a lot that you'll be doing with Joshua, right? Alan, that is so important because so many men try to use ceremony and passage to make up for lack of lifestyle and intimacy. Yes. All along. And so you're absolutely right. As God was really firm to me to say, don't let anything in this rite of passage and ceremony exceed the realities of your current standing relationship with him. That is so huge because you're exactly right. I mean, we do life together. And part of what I've learned by sitting at the feet of older men is my family is my priority over my work. And my children get most of me, most of my mornings, most of my evenings, most of my weekends, most of my vacation, just metaphorically, that's the best way I can name it. And so the ceremony was not out of context. And Joshua actually knows my friends. He has relationship with my friends now to different degrees and some of them not close, but I make the sacrificial effort to give him access and proximity to my friends. So yes, you're absolutely right that the ceremony was not inconsistent with how we do regular life. And it wasn't also the end. We now have that monumental moment and we have a metaphor, you know, this mythic picture of man scouts for our decade, yes. which we refer to every day. But like today, you know, where we have a date, it's Thursday and Thursday's date night in, in our house. And so every other week, Sherry and I swap kids. And so tonight is date night. And Joshua and his best buddy, Andrew, harvested their first garter snake with their blow dart guns <laughs> that they made by themselves. And he Whoa. was so fired up. And two days ago, I came home from work and he has a gardener snake. And he said, Daddy, we got our first snake all on our own. They made their own blow dart guns. They set up their own hunt and they killed the snake. He said, will wow. you skin this for me? Because he's not yet you know, at that point of right. th those skills to skin. So I skinned it. And tonight our date is to go to Home Depot together and buy a router, which is the next tool we've wanted to add to yes. our workshop, which is one small desk in my little suburban house. And we're going to stain a piece of oak and use a router to finish it and mount the snake and present it to Andrew. All of that is part of Man Scouts, but it takes on this epic quality because we framed it as more than just being a kid. We framed it as God the Father validating my son and initiating him through me and through a company of men through a process over time with several ceremonies as part of that. That's so good, Morgan. And I think what I want the listeners to know is it takes the pressure off you as you're listening to this, don't go to shame or condemnation or, wow, my son now is 15. I missed it. Like, I should have done this when he was 10. Mm -hmm. Or my son's grown up. He's out of the house. 
but it may be something that you can do with their children as a grandfather one day. And if you're a single mom listening, there's ways you can do this and invite your son into more through a company of men, relatives, friends at the church. There are ways you can do this. There's not one specific model. It's more of an invitation into how do you awaken the hearts of your children? Yeah. And there's not one set way to do it. It's not a tip or a technique. It's not a one-time conversation. It really is, I think, how do you pour in on a regular basis? Yes. My oldest son is 15, so he's starting high school this year. And before he started high school, I thought, I really want to do something that speaks to him at this age. And we're really close. But what we did was I took him out to his favorite restaurant. He loves queso. So chips and queso are like manna to him. And so brought him to a Mexican restaurant and just said, hey, let's go grab lunch today. That's all he thought it was because it's part of an ongoing relationship with him. It's not this out of the blue random thing. And at lunch, as we started talking, I was just saying, you're really about to go into a new stage of life, high school, a lot of changes, a lot of opportunities to grow into young manhood. And so what he didn't know is I had a journal with me. And in the journal, I had already filled out like the first 15 pages. So this is not a journal for him to fill out. He's got those. But it's a journal from me to him that I will continue to write in over the next year. And I said, hey, while we're here, I just wanted to read some things to you. I've got you this journal. His eyes got real big. And we had a corner table, so we weren't near a lot of distraction. And just started reading to him about how proud I was of him as his father and how I knew that he would be facing new things in this coming season of life and how I wanted to be there for him, how God's there for him, but also how I want him to know there's a fellowship of men there for him. And so in those early pages, I just got to a point and said, here are six or seven men who I trust 150%, and I would love for you to get to know them better over this time, because there may be some questions that you'd feel more comfortable asking one of them. I want to be there for you, and I am there for you, but there may be times you want to ask some other man a Mm -hmm. question. And this is a great group, because what I wanted him to understand is the modern world will try to answer those questions through media, through music, through movies, in ways that don't necessarily reflect God's heart at all. So they'll try to answer those questions in oftentimes the wrong way. Your peers, other 15-year-old boys, will try to tell you what's important or how to treat women. But they don't know. They're in the boat with you. Like they haven't had enough life to really understand the right answers and how to live well. So they have good hearts, but they don't have the answers. But here are a group of men who do. And some of the men are in their 30s and some are in their 70s. Mm -hmm. Grandparents, you're one of the men. And it made Gray's heart come alive because his next question was, well, like you and I are going to meet with these men together? And I just smiled and said, not necessarily. Like here's their email. Here's their phone number. They are open and they are interested in getting to know you. And so I'd love for you to spend time with them. If you have a question, shoot them an email, call them up. And after that, then Morgan about, this was probably two weeks later, you emailed Gray and said, hey, I'd love to go to lunch with you. And I'd love for you to tell a little bit of that story because I want the listeners to hear, yeah, sometimes it's you as the parent making the initial move, the journal, the ceremony. But it's also inviting them into a trusted fellowship of other men yes. with boys. And so, uh, yeah, tell me about and the listeners what happened that day at lunch. Oh, so incredible. And for those of you that know Alan and know Gray, I'd really ask you just out of respect for Gray to keep this confidential in that to not approach him and talk to him about it because this is between father and son and son and uncle because it really is holy and sacred space. And part of the model that we've used is from the Hawaiian culture, where they use the concept of uncle a lot that's beyond just blood relations. The Hawaiian culture believes that an uncle 
is any older man, as you said, Alan, either he might be 30, he might be 70, but an older man that you respect and esteem and that you are willing to lean into. And he, even more importantly, is willing to offer to you. And so we use the term affectionately in our culture around here of uncles to communicate, I care about you and you have access to me. So it's so great to get together with Gray and just to be an uncle and said, Father, show me how to communicate that I am making myself available as his uncle. And so we picked out a place that he loves to eat. And we went out to lunch and you could tell he was kind of like, what can I order? What can't I order? And I said, get whatever you want. Like, this is about you, Gray. And we sat down and we talked about high school and his summer. And it was just great to come to the center of his heart and hear and witness a couple things. And one is not being dad. I could witness very deeply God's hand and working on his life without getting caught up in the struggles. You know, it was beautiful to be a witness for him. But here's was so powerful to be able to explain to Gray, Gray, I'm making myself available to you as an uncle. And I made a laminated card with a Bible verse that I felt like God had given me for him to throw in his wallet. And on the back, I put my name and I put my phone number and my email. And I said, this is mine, but it's a mythic picture of all the men in your life that play this role, you have access. You have a hotline to get to us. You have a lifeline whenever you need it. And I said, when you have a gift card for GameStop, it doesn't do any good unless you spend it and get a game. <laughs> and so having a gift card is okay, but spending it and having the game really brings some life. And I said, I like when money comes in. And I don't like when money goes out. And so it's really good to have some assets. And I said, Gray, you have some kingdom assets that are far deeper and far richer than you even know. And it's this fellowship of uncles. I said, you've been privileged to have a really good dad. And so we encourage you, go to him, trust him, you know, move towards him first. But you need uncles. And we are available and we're assets that are only as valuable as your willingness to cash in. But the ball is in your court and I am making myself available to you. And Alan, in it, it was really beautiful because I was able to share with him some of my story and he was eyes wide open going, you did what? You (laughs) what? And there is that thing that the teenage boy wants to know, oh, you were like me and had those same struggles. And so that means I one day can be like you because though we don't see ourselves as they see us, we're giants in the land to those younger men. And in my years, when I was Gray's age, all of the men that I was associated with, the enemy was using to bring darkness in my life, to bring porn, to bring evil, to bring, you know, ill-gotten gain. It's what those men thought offered life because of their brokenness. Right. And and a lot of them were kind of good men, but they were just doing what guys do without being yielded to God and his kingdom. But in that time, I was able to say, Gray, you have some amazing assets and I'm making myself available. Also... I was able to say, Gray, this relationship is you and me. It's not Alan's son. This is Gray so and Morgan. And so you have my confidentiality of what you share with me stays with me. And you could see him ease up to go, really? You want to be my friend? And the last piece that I think is important to mention, it was so great for me to say, tell me about your dad and what's your relationship like? And Alan, I came straight to your office in tears of awe of your impact on your son. When your son says things like, my dad will drop anything if I need him to, to be with me. He will take me to lunch at any time. I know I'm more important Mm -hmm. than my dad's work. And I know, he said, my dad is so wise. I feel like I can talk to him about anything. Which sons can say that? And so I commend you as a dad, well done, because we often beat ourselves up for all the not yet and our shortcomings. But I want to say you're modeling beautifully. You're loving well as a dad and... Gray still needs more than you. Right. And that's what I want 
to keep walking in more myself is how do we, through a community of men and women, raise our children well, walking with God, full of life, and even at the age of eight, nine, ten, or older, calling them up into the more. Yes. Calling them up because the world will call them into something. Yep. I mean, we have to present a message of life and of Jesus and the gospel that in its truest form is more enticing than anything the world can throw at them. Exactly. And if we don't, and it's not just mom and dad, but if we don't as a fellowship, they'll get lulled into whatever else is out there saying, exactly. here's life. I love the way Donald Miller puts it. He said that our hearts are made for a larger story and they will gravitate to the largest story they find. That is universal to every child. They will gravitate to the biggest, best story they can find. So the question is, is the kingdom story that we are living and inviting them into bigger and better and more life-filled than any wow. other story that they're finding among their peers and in their culture. And it's a really big challenge internally for us to look in the mirror in our own soul and say, is that what we believe? Mm -hmm. And is that what we're choosing to live in the kingdom of God? Because we can only offer what we live. That's so powerful. And as listeners, wherever you are with your children, those of you that have young children, high school age children, it's not too late. They are hungry to hear from your heart, to know ways that you have learned to walk with God. And so you will know the unique nature of each of your children and how to approach them. We just wanted to give you a snapshot, an idea of what we're doing currently in the lives of some of our kids. We didn't talk about our daughters today, and we both have daughters, and that's going to be in a future podcast down the road. Mm -hmm. So we will get back and we will talk about that. And for men raising daughters, it is a little different. I mean, it's actually totally different. Mm -hmm. And so we'll go into how we're pursuing their hearts in a future podcast. But for now, we just want to invite you into the joy and kind of the unknown of going after the hearts of your children. There's more resources that are for parents raising their children. One highly recommended is Fighting for the Hearts of Your Children. Also, we have Raising Boys and Raising Girls. All three of those available as audio on RansomedHeart.com. We'll see you next week.